Also Maria Pia. Maria Pia is one of our speakers. Ah, okay. One of our panelists. And I'm, I'm afraid we may have lost. Well, but one... maybe we sh she has to log out and log in again. Like I did. Yeah, maybe, maybe be back. It only works in the second time you get it. That's always the solution. Just like <laughs> let it go for a while and then go back. Oh, like restart? <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's, it's very strange. So we have one, we had Vivek. I don't know if Vivek is coming back. Do you think? And I think Daniel Melhem is not here, right? So maybe. No, Maria, we do not see you. No. We we see Maria. She's she's over in the text box and over in the in the chat, and she says, "Can you see me?" Oh, Maria, I, I send Maria now. Uh, okay. I'm not seeing the her comments, so I'm wondering on the, on the right side. Yeah. yeah. And there should be like a little chat. The grid view automatically, so like as more people join us, do it ready mentioned by the size. So like, I don't know if there, for example, I just four okay. clicking the screen, and perhaps that's why we don't see her. Yeah, we have uh, Ed Ted D and Ted D's uh, coming and going uh, as we go along. So maybe once we get Maria back, um, I think people will come, drop in and drop out. That's normal, yeah. Yeah, I, I I have the sessions in my cell phone, and you can switch into sessions like swiping. Okay, so uh, we'll just there. We have oh, welcome, Mark Muller. Are you Eberstein? Are you? Uh, can you hear us? I scared him away. I think <laughs> so. Maybe I won't, I won't. We'll just uh, keep going. Well, should we start? Should we start and just, um, I thought, you know, I mean, I, I, this is very interesting question that they gave us. The 20 nations of Latin America are resource rich, but economically fragile, especially now during the pandemic. How might they develop to become more politically stable? What tipping points will define the future of Latin America and to what do their business leaders aspire? And so I thought if we each, Maria wanted to start, but we still have a lot, we don't have Maria. Oh, there is Maria. Can we, can we uh, hear you, Maria, or see you? I can see you and I can hear you. Can you see me? Not see, but hear. I can hear. I suspect when she talks, if one of us turns off our camera, it'll probably, it'll probably allow for her to, to, to be seen. I'm going to turn off my camera and see if that helps her to be seen. No, that didn't work. No, that that's not the thing. Uh, just a whole phone and a oh, okay. yeah. yeah, it's back. Awesome. <laughs> we see you now. Great. Okay. Thank you. So um, we uh, are. We have uh, now attendees, so I thought what we could do is just start with this general discussion and go down the list. Uh, Maria, you wanted to start uh, with you know, these comments um, about how might the Latin American nations, the 20 Latin American nations research risks, but economically fragile, uh, how might they develop to become more politically stable? What tipping points will define the future of Latin America? And to what do their business leaders aspire? I think that is just throwing it open to make general comments about what's happening in the region. And given your, you are from Chile, is that right? Uh oh. Yes, from Chile. Yes. Okay. So, in Spain. <laughs> so we're going to have five minutes each. If you could go ahead, uh, Maria, and kick it off. And now, 
uh, you, you're muted again, Maria. I'm muted. I'm muted. I was, sorry, I was, I was the last one. Well, my name is Maria Pia Quebeque. I'm an economist. Uh, I'm founder of Maquebec and Co. and DT Code, also chair of the 30% Club Chile. Uh, I have been in the blockchain space for a while and uh, now living in Spain since January. A pleasure to meet you all. Uh, the last year have been, you know, all, all my life I have been able to work with public, you know, pu public leaders, mainly in Latin America, also business leaders, uh, and, you know, now in this European blockchain revolution endeavor. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, welcome. I, I guess we're going to go down the line and introduce ourselves, and I guess I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Roy Nelson, a social professor uh, at Thunderbird School of Global Management. Um, Thunderbird School of Global Management is well known for its graduate programs, but now also offers an undergraduate program. So I'm associate dean of the Thunderbird uh, School of Global Management undergraduate program. So please send your undergraduate students to us. Um, and uh, so we are just quickly uh, going down and introducing ourselves, and then we will uh, start. So I think uh, the next one might be um, Victor. Would you could you please introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, I'm Victor Savia. I'm from Uruguay. Um, I'm the CEO of Brokerware. We do software for capital markets. Um, thank you for being there. Okay, fantastic. And then Mariana. Hello, everyone. My name is Mariana. I'm founder and CEO at AgriSmart, which is an ag tech uh, startup supporting agriculture to be more sustainable and productive, and also working very closely with both civil society, government, and private sector to create uh, good policies for agriculture and carbon. Fantastic. And then uh, I think, okay, Roderick is here again. Can you please introduce yourself? I'm Rod Miller. I'm president and CEO of Invest Puerto Rico. We are the promotion investment agency responsible for driving jobs and investment uh, into Puerto Rico. Very glad to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. And then I think, Daniel, um, Melham, can we see you or hear you? We may be having some technical problems on that side. Okay, so Daniel... Melham from Nightbridge Partners, um, one of the things that we have discovered that works pretty well is if you exit and then come back, uh, sometimes that works to to uh, bring you bring you back. And um, let's see, okay. So uh, what we could do then is just uh, start off with these very general questions and. Uh, we, uh, you know, I think essentially what these questions are asking us uh, is to give your assessment of the region in terms of the prospects for business leaders uh, in the region and just general comments related to these uh, very general questions that, that we were given as part of this panel. And if each of you could just take five minutes, maybe we could start. Uh, I think that, Maria, did you mention last time that you had a strong preference for going first? Did, did I get she that right? Or? Last. She mentioned yeah. it. <laughs> she preferred to go last. She wants to go last. Yeah. I but I, but uh, I can kick it off if, if that works. I, I'd be more than glad to kick it off. Sure. Okay, Rod. Rod, if you could please do that. Perfect. Uh, I've prepared a few comments, so hopefully these are these are interesting. And, and as recently as January of 2020, it seemed like a dramatically different world. At that time, 67 percent of economists with the National Association for Business Economics in the U.S. expected the U.S. economy to grow anywhere from 1% to 3%. The U.S. unemployment rate at that time had dropped to its lowest rate since 1969, and there were more job openings than people searching for jobs. Few foresaw the emerging COVID-19 virus as a likely pandemic that would sweep across the world, leaving a violent trail of pain and death. Now, after months of medical quarantine and economic shutdown, it is a dramatically different world. There's much instability in the financial and economic marketplace, in addition to causing widespread fear due to its high level, levels of contagion and fatality, COVID-19 has dramatically slowed the economy. We're in what many business leaders, economists, and politicians believe to be a perhaps well overdue 
global recession, the economic effects of these challenges are already being felt as the stock market has plunged deeply in airlines, the hotel industry, financial services, and the energy sector. Professional sports teams have canceled seasons. Countries and cities have quarantined their residents. More than 40 million Americans have filed for unemployment. And most companies have implemented remote working practices to prevent the further spread of the pandemic. Our world will never be the same. And as we know, when the United States economy gets a cold, it normally represents the flu, pneumonia, or even worse for Latin America. Despite these challenges, there's hope. As the economy goes through the dramatic corrections, COVID-19 is also shifting the decision-making paradigm through which companies, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and individuals must respond. And I think that's a key point, that the decision-making paradigm in terms of what constitutes a competitive decision is different than what it would have been just a year ago. This paradigm transformation will render business and society as we once knew it irrevocably changed from social distancing to remote working. These changes are already underway and others will play out over the coming years to ensure society's long-term sustainability. Social isolation will cause people to rethink existing values regarding how they interface with others and define quality connections. Health and health security will become the most important global issue as lives literally hang in the balance. Remote work protocols established during the crisis will likely extend to well after the crisis is over. Long-term disruptions in business operations will cause many companies to rethink capital expenditure models, both in terms of expansion to new markets, as well as real estate portfolios. Um, policy discussions and investment dialogues suggest a deeper focus on the environment, fintech and e-currency, cybersecurity, blockchain, and healthcare. Supply chain gaps that were exposed due to the crisis, especially in the pharmaceutical and medical device sectors, are prompting for more protectionist trade policies in the U.S. and Europe and pushing companies which have set up in China and India to reconsider nearshoring alternatives. It is a different world, and therein lies the opportunity. The question is, can this shift present an opportunity for Latin America to reposition itself in the global economy? And I think the answer to that question is yes. The time for the change. So every major economic shift throughout history, whether it was industrialization or the rise of the computer age, has created new pockets of wealth and opportunity. As COVID-19 has afflicted, afflicted more than 34 million people worldwide and killed more than a million, five out of 10 of the highest co countries with the highest levels of mortality are in Latin America. The combination of COVID-19 impacts on Latin America and longstanding economic issues related to market stability and economic inequality mean that now is a critical moment for leadership to take action. These negative realities can only be counterbalanced by the proliferation of new technologies, increased access to global markets and information, and accelerated investments pushing the world to where it has to be uh, for us to survive and move forward. For Latin America to truly take advantage of these opportunities, I think there are a few things that need to, need to happen. Number one, uh, public-private partnerships. So there needs to be a new interdependent style of capitalism that is driven by the global market. So we're not talking about a socialist style of capitalism or a socialist style of government, but we're talking about an interdependent style of capitalism that rightly recognizes that the private sector must lead and needs pointed government collaboration to compete uh, to, to compete on a global scale. Uh, I want to underscore that this isn't about state-run companies, about, but about the public sector making needed investments to spur greater innovation and entrepreneurship. My philosophy is that the private sector should point the government towards the opportunities to increase its competitiveness, while the governments need to ensure that their investments result in greater opportunities for economic participation across the economic strata of all their population. That's number one. Number two, there must be a North Star, a well-defined North Star, whether that's, and that's, and in many cases, I'm going to think that's going to be around technology, but it's really about what are the competitive advantages where your economies have the ability to distinguish themselves based on the assets that you have in abundance? These can be human assets or physical. The opportunities point to emerging next generation technology and approaches to work and workforce development as the best solution for long term growth. So, in other words, defining that North Star and the assets that will allow for that North Star to become a reality. Number three. Countries must invest in infrastructure that ensure quality of life, access to job, corporate growth opportunities, and a healthy population. Number four, governments must remember that it's all about people. And so people need democracy and they need stability. 
and uh, and 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 for governments to really remember that it's all about people. If they're doing a j- good job at that, that will really represent you know population population growth, uh, investment in human capital, and economic opportunity for residents. And then lastly, number five is we've got to remember in Latin America that we have the power to change our narrative. And that changing the narrative is really what's going to create the buzz that's going to create uh, more investment in our, our economies. Uh, we need to change the narrative by owning our history, sharing our stories, and recognizing that we can create a new future. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rod. I, I thought this is uh, very, gonna, that's going to provoke some interesting comments for sure. But so I thought maybe what we could do is just have everyone present or may, say it a few words first, and then we go down and have time for discussion. So uh, the question is, our order is a little bit scrambled, so maybe we, we go next to... Uh, I can take it. Is that is that Daniel Melham? Is that Daniel? Yes. Hi, how are you? Is that... Are you the one offering to take it, or was it Victor? No. Oh, Victor. Okay, so... <laughs> so, Daniel, we're going to come back to you uh, we, in a moment. We cannot see you. We can hear you, but we cannot see you. We can see your picture, Daniel, so... Okay. That's good. And we can hear you loud and clear. So, but we're going to start here with Victor and then uh, we'll, we'll move down the list. Okay. Um, when we talk about Latin America, uh, we can tell there was a Latin America until 2019. And then something happened in the world, the whole world. And it's not the same Latin America that we had last year. So many things changes. Up to 2019, there was, I think, like, three different Latin America. We can say that we have the same language or almost the same language, uh, the same cultural roots. Uh, but anyway, there was a Latin America from the Pacific side, which had opened very well to the world, had bilateral agreements with many countries, was developing well. Yeah. Then you have the Northern part of Latin America that was doing a lot of uh, businesses with US. And then we have the Atlantic Latin America that it had to be led by Brazil somehow. Uh, it didn't get really to nothing. We had so many travels um, with extreme populism position from left to right positions. So it, it was really a mess. Then something happened that was the, was the pandemics that happened to all the world. Um, the, everything structured differently. So. Uh, responses to, to that pandemic uh, was different in different regions. Um, for example, here in Uruguay, when, when you look at the picture here in Uruguay, in terms of economy, number of cases, and the way the pandemic has gone in the last six months, you can tell that something different has gone compared to the region. It is interesting to see, uh, for example, cities in the border to Brazil, where the number of cases in each side of the border is completely different. And you can literally walk from one city to another, just crossing the street. And um, you have many cases in one side, so little cases here. So I, I think the response to, to that pandemic rely on, on strengths and um, difficulties that already, already had, we already had in Latin America that were structurally different in any country. Um, Later on, I want to talk a, a little bit, bit more about that, but you, you can keep on talking. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think that's uh, th- that's definitely a key yes, point, sir. right? The, the different responses. Roy? Yeah, can you hear me? You can't hear me? I can go on. Oh, <laughs> uh, nobody can hear me, right? No. Uh, I can hear you well. Uh, okay. So... Uh, Mariana, yeah, can you hear me? You can hear you. Okay. Well. Yep. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor. And I think uh, maybe we should go to Mariana to uh, break up the gender balance a little bit here. Sure. Um, well, you, hello, uh, guys. Yes, uh, totally. Well, in my perspective, and perhaps like a quite different perspective from the majority of the people in the table here, like being a woman, being younger and working with agriculture, 
uh, is like what I can see from Latin America and the, the main reasons why we have this fragile economy, even though we are rich in resources, is based on our institutions. So I really like that book, Why Nation Fails. Uh, and I really think the historical um, legacy that we have from the colonialism from Spain and from Portugal is what like always worked that way of um, extracting the majority of our resources and value and not leaving the, 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 the current institutions here to develop themselves. And what I see nowadays is a very strong push to change those institutions and to change the dynamics of politics in, in Latin America. And I really like the comment that Rod said about we owning our history, right? And that's what we have to do and we have to create ownership on our destiny from now on. So in points of Brazil, uh, where, what I think that could be a path to, to take us there, uh, and, we, and when we look in Latin America in general, I really rely on innovation, entrepreneurship, and agriculture. It's like agriculture is one of the main economic uh, activities for the majority of our countries, and it's so important. So I see a very good opportunity on the decommoditization of agriculture, on us like stopping only to export commodities uh, and continue to extract our resources, but finding innovative ways of extracting value out of sustainable ecosystem, protecting Amazonia, creating high value products with our agricultural goods and producing technology as a way to create uh, resources and, and increasing the, the, the patrimony of the country and of the people. So in that sense, uh, what I see what is being done differently in Brazil in the past years is when us Latins stopped waiting for the government to do something. I think like it's not in the destiny of the government to make us go forward or to make us be economically stable. Of course, we all uh, want to have better policies and I really believe in the power of technology and data to drive good policy, but we cannot wait for it. And that's what I think like since I'm six years now with AgroSmart and before that I was already an entrepreneur and I'm all under 30 years old. So I think like there is a huge movement in innovation in Brazil where people are solving our challenge. Like when we talk about agriculture, we have no connectivity in the fields. We are not waiting for the government to solve the infrastructure problem. The private sector are bringing low cost technology and resources so we can get data in the field and we can increase the yields and still be sustainable. So that mindset shifting in the market is driving that. I, for example, love the example of Puerto Rico. I had the chance to follow up the program Parallel 18 a few years ago. So I, I love to see the Puerto Rico scene like it was a, a, a hot ecosystem for Latin American startups bridging a gap with the US market. And that's where I think it's our power. Like we don't need to wait for other people to do something. We can get together. We can foster entrepreneurship, one entrepreneur to another and, and using our power together and our data and our tech to help the, the governments to create better policies that will support that growing environment. So for me, there is no other solution than to use uh, technology in our favor to bridge those gaps and put them to serve our talents that in my opinion like one of the main talents in Latin America is agriculture. All right well thank you Mariana that's uh it's a very powerful set of comments there so I'm, I'm seeing some common themes but uh I think this is this is very nice so Maybe what we can do now is turn to Daniel Melhem. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? We didn't, you didn't get a chance to do that earlier and, and then uh, make your remarks. Sure, thank you so much. I hope everyone can, can hear me, although I'm not sure if you are looking at me or not. Um, well, I'm an investment banker. Uh, I manage a company called Knightsbridge Partners. I've been investing in, in, in Latin America for a while. And, and I deal with, with lots of international funds and investors who are looking at Latin America. Um, so that's mainly what I do on a, on a daily basis. Um, what I have seen right now, just to talk about our region briefly, is that things are not really working well. Beyond COVID, which has been uh, a tremendous disaster, and as someone just mentioned, um, you know, we are five countries in Latin America are in the top 10 um, in terms of cases and, and, and death um, across the world, is that you know we're, we're not we're never really prepared. We're never really prepared for an economic crisis. We're really never prepared for a downturn um, in commodity prices. We're never really re you know prepared in terms of infrastructure and technology 
uh, were never really prepared in terms of uh, education. So, so we see other regions of the world, you know, that they that they were not countries, you know, when you know Chile, Argentina, all these countries were became nations 200 years ago or more. Uh, I'm not exactly know the date for Brazil, and and then we see countries that were not even democracies. They were part of a larger region in the world, like South Korea and 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 other countries that they have tried in only 50 years in, in a way that we haven't been able to do it. So I'm a little bit more worried about the region, A, because I don't see too many Latin Americans looking and investing in their own countries. Right now there's, a, there's an outflow of capital from Latin America to other regions of the world, primarily to the United States, because it has always been the US dollar and the United States a source of um, a, of a strength for 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 um, in investing your money, um, you know the the country that by far I, I I thought I knew the best was Chile, and I was in Chile last year just before the riots began and 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 a, and I, I was there about a week earlier uh, those riots, and everybody was happy with Chile. When I was there, like at the end of the year, just after the riots, all the riots would continue, uh, and you had 20, 30, 40 people uh, killed by the police in, in different uh, areas of the city. And then every single person that I had met just a few months before, and they were, they were not happy with the economy, they were not happy with uh, the growth of the economy, you know, but, but they were okay investing in their own country. Now everybody's looking at investing elsewhere. So what we see is that there's going to be a tremendous drain of capital, not only capital, but also human capital from Latin America to other regions of the world. And, and this is something that uh, I think has been accelerated mainly because of the bad policies we, we took you know, years ago and also by COVID. Uh, I received so many phone calls from friends in Chile uh, and other countries. They want their children to go to universities in the United States or Europe, you know, and they want my help. You know, where did you graduate? What I have to do, uh, which I never received in the past. So I'm I'm probably the pessimistic of the group um, uh, about the region. I think we are well behind the rest of the world, and I don't see how we're going to um, uh, we, without foreign investment, without our own. Um, uh, business leaders investing heavily in our countries. I don't see how we're going to stop, um, you know, this this cycle. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, very contrasting view there. So that's what makes an exciting uh, panel. So thank you. And I think now we will turn finally to Maria for uh, the closing statement. Sorry, I was, I'm so used to the touch screen that I was yeah. confused. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and, you know, very interesting insights. The reason why I wanted to be the last is because, you know, finally each of you were speaking about, you know, what is behind of the thing I have been working on the last two years that it has to do with with blockchain, deal identities, uh, and, um, you know, startups and women. Uh, what happens that, you know, in Latin America, what the COVID has to show us worldwide, the COVID is a glitch, the glitch in any system from ourselves. We have, you know, in during the lockdowns, we have all have insights of our lives, include, including uh, also about, you know, our families, our work, our country. And so what the COVID has done in Latin America, it has increased the inequality and poverty that was already there. So, and, and when I talk about inequality, I also, I, it's, you know, women or gender in leadership or in the economy, it's included. So, as Mariana said, you know, we are in a, actually we are in a breaking point. 
we are a breaking point that it started some years ago with the era of the internet because it changed our mindset of what power, what or how institution, and finally how the economy should, you know, should distribute well. You know, when you, when you can tweet to uh, Trump, the Pope or anyone, you know, it means that you have a very a horizontal way of seeing power. And that works for any kind of institution. And that's the mindset that we have new generations. So, and that's the reason why in Chile we started having the riots. And because the people who were in the streets they were mainly young people. And the same happened in Colombia, in Paris, and then people older, they get, you know, move uh, from these young generations, uh, you know, that are fiercely, and they are in some way or another asking for rights for everyone. And so we have a very small window, as, you know, to do something because the talents that we have, the economy and the health talent that we have, especially in Latin America, and the inequality, it's, it's, now it's huge and it's going to be worse next year, actually the coming months. So as Mariana said, it's, we have an opportunity and we need to use technology for that. And blockchain is a technology that allows to distribute power, create much more trust, uh, create a more trustable financial system and you know, uh, assets, of any kind. And when I say assets, it also includes what Mariana had said, you know, actually there's a, there's a project in the Amazonia that what they're trying is they're going, they, they want to trace all the biodiversity of the Amazonia. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a project that was, you know, um, you know, the, the economic world, no, it's the economist and the World Economic Forum were supporting. So in terms of communication, dissemination of the project. And what they are looking for, for instance, it has to do with to trace all the biodiversity. So in case there's a, a company that wants to use the, the biodiversity or the knowledge as pharmaceutical does to create drugs, you know, through smart contracts, they're seeking on how they can have profits from the profit of the pharma, uh, of the pharmaceutical, that so there's a really opportunity to create, you know, this new business model, this new financial system, you know, financial uh, system, and you know, and I really think that in, in Latin America we have a very resilient uh, human capital, and uh, because for centuries, we have lived in, you know, in very, I would say, we have not had the best technology from the beginning. I mean, we have these labs, uh, compared at least to Europe. So there's a huge opportunity. And also what technology can do is also something that Mariana spoke about. It has to do, we can bridge. I mean, today, no matter where you live, you can work worldwide. We work, you know, in a network, we are creating the new, I mean, the real digital economy, because to be honest, what we, what we thought it was a digital economy, it was not really, we, we was just the internet era. I mean, we're just, we were just uploading, you know, papers or documents in the cloud. So now we really have an opportunity to build an economy that could create, you could, you know, work in a network. And also that is what is very, very important. It has to do that people can receive or they really contribute to a, a production uh, chain. And that is something that have, we have not been able to do it. For instance, Uber, what does Uber? Uber is, is from the internet era. They centralize everything. They get, you know, they increase their market cap. Uh, they charge 25% to the drivers. But, you know, with new technologies such as uh, blockchain and, you know, and use in synergy with others like AI, 
you know, people can, you know, the, you know, the driver and the person who need to get that drive, they don't need an intermediate. So if one, if someone wants to be the intermediate, they really will have to create more value to have the right to connect people. And that is what we can do. I mean, uh, in Brazil, in Argentina, there is an amazing ecosystem. Uh, they know this technology. And by the way, just to let you know, why the Argentinians know a lot, a lot about blockchain? Because they suffered the Corralitos in 2002. So they learned that they really need to back up their money and that they're not safe in the bank. And, and you know, in also there's a, an amazing ecosystem, a fintech ecosystem in Chile. Uh, it's a, you know, innovation ecosystem have in, in Colombia, especially in Medellin. Uh, you know, the last year also in places like in Monterrey, you know, they have been working on new business models, new technologies. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can offer to the world. Uh, no matter where we are located. So first is, is that we should forget that because we are in Latin America, we don't have so many chances because now if you can connect your citizens of the world. Um, but there's also a huge challenge that it has to do that we need to bring a lot of people to this digital economy. And, and for that, digital sovereign identities, it's a way that, you know, you know, a digital sovereign identity, so where a, a person can have, owns their data, should be like the birth certificate. I mean, because if we promote that, that means that any person, you know, in, in Brazil, in those small villages, or in, in El Monte, in, in Colombia, they will be able to get into this new digital economy that we are building. So there's a lot of what we can do. Of course, there's a lot of political or institutional, I would say, it's shaking, you know, yeah. in different ways. But still, we can still go and build things with what we already have. And something that has to do with the lack of integration of the region that we have been suffering the last, 10 years, I would say, too. Uh, also, a digital identity could help us to, you know, we could trade if we are on an online platform. We, you know, that's a way that new, the new integration models should be designed. Um, I mean, I yeah, I think yeah. that, Ma Ma Maria, I mean, I, you've raised so many interesting points. And uh, I think that um, there's some common themes here and there's, you know, clearly a, we're at a, a, a cho choice point or a decision point right now in the region. And uh, all of you seem optimistic, maybe with the exception of Daniel has some uh, concerns, right? Big concerns. But maybe it's a chance now for us to, I think we still have some, uh, we have some panelists or I'm sorry, some attendees, participants that might want to ask some questions of, of these distinguished panels. So may I just ask one question before? May I, Roy? I wanted sure. to take the chance uh, on what Maria said on the Amazonia and sustainability and ask Daniel uh, if his perspective on the ESG investments that now like it literally it's a boom, right? Like everyone now is worried about ESG. And I think if there is a place where it's most possible to find ESG assets is in developing countries where we can prove impact in so many areas like agriculture and so on. So if Daniel see an opportunity of perhaps using ESG as a vehicle to bring back investments to Latin America, avoiding the capital escape that he's mentioning, because like I do, I see way uh, more opportunities here than in the U.S., for example. And what can we as business leaders do to to make that happen? Thank you, Mariana. Well, may, maybe I'm a little bit less optimistic because I'm one of the oldest ones here in the panel. Um, having said that, um, it's tough. I think that uh, for, for everything that has to do with investments, uh, being local or, or foreign unit trust, and I think that, um, you know, we, we haven't been as a region uh, doing well on, on that side. 
I think that, um, you know, we haven't chosen good leaders. Um, you know, we, we tend to make the same mistakes time and time again. Um, you know, we're always needing to go to foreign, um, ask for foreign capital to solve the problems that we, we create internally. Um, we try to overexpend ourselves, so we, we, we have huge deficits. And, and, and when you look at the region, uh, you know, Brazil is a country that I, I really like, and almost every single country, we, we have things that nobody else has. We have tremendous natural resources. We, we have great human capital. Um, in, in most cases, many countries have everything you need. You, you have, you know, um, food resources, energy resources, um, you know, water resources, and still we, we, we tend to um, continue making the same mistakes. One of the things that we, we live today that is different before is that, you know, everybody can read on the internet, you know, how a country is doing on, 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 on an immediate basis, and, and that keeps investors from, from, from coming. Um, you know, when President Macron in Argentina became elected, there was a big conference uh, in which I participated, and we were trying, not, not we myself, but the government was trying to bring big investors to, to Argentina to invest in the country, and most of the big companies didn't want to come because they thought that until the problem with the trust was not solved, there was not going to be any investment. And with trust comes the rule of law and so forth. So we, we can talk about different vehicles to invest and technology, um, which is all fine. And, 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 and it may create some uh, sporadic, um, you know, islands where people, you know, invest in one way and things work for a while. But, but, but then to look at that as a, a, an archipelago, that every single island, every single person, every single village, every single city, every single um, infrastructure project is, is uh, met, meets its uh, financial needs, I think we're well, you know, um, behind that. Um, so, so to answer your question, Mariana, I, I think um, – we still need to work a lot internally in our countries to, to gain that trust back. Um, and, and then only then, I think, investment and growth will, will come to our region. And, and you see with COVID as well, you know, uh, uh, we, we've been under lockdown in Argentina. I think it's the lar- longest lockdown in, in, in the world. We started on the 19th of March, uh, you know, just as soon as Europe was getting into the lockdown. And, you know, we're still legally under lockdown in Argentina because there's many businesses, they cannot work, office business, uh, office buildings are closed. We have no internal travel, so there's no flights within Argentina. So anybody that lives in the province of Salta in the north of Argentina cannot travel by air to Salta nor by car because the borders are closed. So if, if you look at the map of the world in terms of flights, I think Argentina and North Korea are the only ones without international flights and local flights. Our skies are empty. Um, even with that, even with a, a long lo- lockdown, we still have 750,000 uh, infections. We still have somewhere around 14,000 deaths, which I think the, the number is much uh, larger than that. Again, trust is an issue with, with our government, uh, a big issue. So. I think we're, we, we are going to miss the opportunities uh, that, that Roderick basically explained that, you know, after a pandemic, after a downturn in the economy, after a war, there's a tremendous amount of opportunities. Um, and I think as a region, we are, you know, if we look at Latin America 10 years ago, there was two Latin Americans. One was following Venezuela, and we know where that went, didn't go very well. And another one was following you know, uh, Chile, maybe Mexico, in in a way, open market um, uh, economies, uh, you know, much more interplay in terms of trade and investment with with other uh, regions of the world. Um, Today, we don't look like cut in half between the Venezuelan side and and the Chilean, Mexican, um, let's call it, the, the Andean countries side, I think now everybody is on their own. You know, Argentina, we have our own problems, self-made, by the way. 
Uh, Brazil has its own self-made problems. Mexico has its own self-made problems. Even Chile. Um, eh, I'm happy that Uruguay is doing a little bit better than, than everyone else. Uh, and that's why so many Argentines, especially young Argentinians and em entrepreneurs, are looking at going to Uruguay to live from Uruguay. You're all welcome. Yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> we'll see each other soon in Uruguay. I'm trying to get my, my permit to go to Uruguay, uh, hopefully uh, in November or December. You're welcome home. We can make an asylum. Thank you. Thank you so much. So <laughs> I think we're all on our own. So um, I think we need to take a big look at what we have done so badly for so many years. Because, you know, if you look at any advertising in France, in Germany, in Italy, for 70 years ago, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, the future was Latin America. That's how my family came from Spain, you know, or, or from other parts of the world. We were the future. We were the natural resources. We were uh, the Europeans coming, you know, moving to this part of the world because of the abundance of opportunity. Um, you know, in, in 1895, Argentina was the second wealthiest country in the world. In 1910, we were the second wealthiest country per capita in the world. In 1945, we were the third wealthiest country per capita in the world. But we're not that anymore. And I don't think we will be there uh, that again ever. But at least to, to provide, you know, the, the services, the quality of life, the education, the health care we need for our own citizens, we, we have to look internally. And until we don't do that, I think it's, it's very difficult for us to to move forward. Well, okay, so definitely some different points of view got uh, presented here. We, we've run out of time, believe it or not. We've run out of time. Jose Simois has presented a very interesting comment. Um, Jose, did, did you want to say something? Can you say something? Or did you want to uh, can you see it posted in the chat, his comment? Um, and so how could Latin America attract more interest and commitment from the U.S., Europe, and Asia? Is the environment the answer? This is kind of somehow related to Mariana's uh, question. Could Latin America use environmental protection to attract more interest? So I think what we're seeing is, uh, Daniel is, is pointing out there are se severe challenges and, and issues, but at the same time, the majority of you all could, you know, said, listen, there are great opportunities. There are great opportunities. And so I think Daniel himself would agree with this, but some some of the political issues and the institutional issues need to be straightened out. So um, I don't know. I, I think we do have to stop. Uh, but did anyone have any last closing word? One word quickly. Mar Maria, very quickly. Well, it has to do with that. I mean, of course, the situation is complicated. Uh, you know, the institutional, political, there's a lot of, lack of trust uh, all around Latin America. That's for sure. But that, 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 that doesn't stop startups. Uh, that doesn't, you know, it just challenges much more. Uh, through cooperation and collaboration, we can do amazing things. And that is what you saw here in Europe, especially in Italy at the beginning of this pandemic. Well, there, I like, I like that uh, response. What about you, Victor? No, I, I was just saying that what what are we gonna do with with our startups? What are we gonna protect our startups? Because in times of pandemics, the the balance sheet is not doing well. You know that they're solving problems that that may be shaded out with with the reality now, but there are problems that are gonna emerge in in months from now. Uh, how are we gonna do to protect them in order to to fulfill this this uh, these problems? Because uh, you know. Startups are, are the fuel of, the, of our economy in the future, in the near future. So we got to do something to protect them. You know, I, I, I hopefully got so many zooms here. Like crisis is an opportunity. You know, like maybe there are some startups doing things that that are really popping up now. But there are many startups that are solving problems and maybe shaded up by the crisis right now. And we have to protect them for in the near future. We're gonna need them. Unfortunately, I don't disagree with Daniel uh, in terms of the prospects for the future if all else remains the same. However, my optimism comes from the reality of the amount of social innovation that I'm seeing, of the amount of activity that's happening in the entrepreneurship sector. I think the long-term solution is really going to revolve around 
it's going to come from one of two paths if there's going to be success. Path one is, or one path is, is this idea of, of the, the global community and the opportunity to invest in good companies, no matter where they are, and the ability for, for people to, or companies to distinguish themselves from the markets in which, from their local geography. And that's, a, and so that's a, the idea of this interconnected world and the ability to be able to position companies uh, based on their innovation and solutions that they offer on a global scale which can dis- disconnect it from some of the um, some of the challenges and instability in, in, in Latin American markets. And then the other path forward is, is really, you know, the leadership doesn't normally come from people like me in our 40s, as, uh, as I've been pointed out, as we've been pointed out as the old people um, several times <laughs> during this conversation. But it comes from people in their 20s and 30s that are willing to actually push government to act in different ways. And I think uh, and then the question is, is there enough of a groundswell? of young people to actually have a higher level of accountability in terms of government and how it interfaces so that so that there is a level of stability so that outside investment comes in. Short of those two scenarios, things don't change. Well, you know, to me, just based on uh, everything everyone has been saying, I mean, if, if there are, you know, people like this working to advance these kinds of goals, uh, I think we're in good shape. I think the future, it looks pretty good to me. So on that note, uh, I think, you know, we may have to wrap it up. I don't know if they're going to turn us off or something is going to happen to us, but we're, we're way over the, the time limit. But that just meant we had a great discussion. So thank you. This is fantastic. Thank you for this great panel. And uh, thank you to the attendees. And uh, I think now we do have to wrap it up before they – now they're shutting us down. So. Thanks, everybody. Okay, nice thank you so bye. much. Great to thank meet you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.